a few years ago, uh, it was like 2014 or something like that. I went on a trip to the West Coast. I was invited to give a talk uh, to Apple. And I had no idea what I was going to talk about. And I was busy with other things. So I waited until the night before. And actually, it was the night before at three in the morning. I got to Palo Alto and I was like, I should probably write a talk. Um, so I stayed up all night and I was exhausted the next day. And I wrote this talk. And towards the end, I think it was at five or six a.m., I said, OK, I need to find something Apple specific. I need to say something about their products, their crypto. So I dug into the Apple iOS security guide. And I found a description of how Apple's iMessage, which is their, their um, text messaging, encrypted text messaging system works. And it was obvious at that point that their system was broken. They were using signatures in the wrong order. And so I went in the next morning, completely exhausted, and I gave a talk on TLS and a bunch of things. And I said, at the end of the talk, I said, by the way, there is this problem that I see in the way you're using crypto. You're using your signatures and your encryption in the wrong order. You're not using authenticated encryption. And what that means is there could be some kind of cryptographic attack on your system. Maybe somebody could run an active chosen ciphertext attack on ciphertext generated by iMessage. But that would require another kind of exploitable vulnerability to exist beyond the crypto. And here, I don't know how your system works. So I can only assume that maybe you have some other countermeasures that would prevent this attack. And this whole room full of Apple people, remember that for Apple, information flows in one direction and never the other. <laughs> This whole room full of Apple people smiled at me or something, or I swear they nodded at me. Maybe they winked or something. So I came away from that meeting assuming that they had a countermeasure in place. About six months later, my student and I went back just to check to see if there was a countermeasure. And we found out that no, their system was totally vulnerable. And we were actually able to come up with an exploit. We were able to decrypt Apple's encrypted iMessages using this active chosen ciphertext attack. And we wrote a paper about this. But the story here is that this took a lot of human effort. Uh, it turns out that the it actually required us to come up with a chosen ciphertext attack that worked against this particular encryption scheme, but exploited a vulnerability or a flaw in the way that gzip works, which is a combination. gzip is a combination of replacement coding and Huffman coding and checksums. And it was very complicated. And it was painful. And it took us months and weeks of work. It was really unpleasant. And we decide, I decided then that we would never have that happen again. We would have machines do this kind of exploit work so we wouldn't have to spend six months breaking Apple stuff. And that's the motivation for this work. So I haven't really explained what any of this is. So let me start by giving a little bit of background on chosen ciphertext attacks on symmetric encryption. Okay, so we have known for many, many years, decades, that different kinds of encryption can be secure under one attack model, but insecure under another. And this, this idea has a long and illustrious history. Um, if you go back and you try to find examples for uh, of attacks that work under this very strong model, which is called a chosen ciphertext attack, it's really hard to find the earliest example that isn't some academic paper. Uh, if you dig in, uh, you can really find things that start to crop up. This idea of chosen ciphertext attacks happens to arrive in about the 1990s for asymmetric public key and symmetric crypto. But nobody really cares about it. What, what's the point of a chosen ciphertext attack? Why would anyone care about this? It's a theoretical concern. And then in um, about 1999, Daniel Bleichenbacher found a chosen ciphertext attack on a public key encryption scheme called RSA PKCS number one, V1.5, which happened to be used in SSL at the time. This was a really big deal and allowed people to actually decrypt SSL connections with a lot of queries, but it worked. And then in 2001, Serge Vaudenay came up with an even easier attack that also affected SSL that dealt with the way that uh, the padding was applied to symmetric ciphertexts. And they al it allowed somebody with access to an SSL server to decrypt entire messages in pretty reasonable amounts of time. Um, these chosen ciphertext attacks were considered not really a big deal before that. All of a sudden, the idea that you could submit chosen ciphertext and get the decryption of them was this huge new development that actually mattered. So I'm going to show you Vaudenay's result, which many of you may have seen, but I want to show you how this worked. It's actually really beautiful and simple. I teach it in my intro class. Okay, so the, what Vaudenay pointed out was that many different encryption schemes have to run some kind of padding check or padding stripping when you decrypt a message. And this is because some symmetric encryption schemes, modes of operation like CBC mode, require you to pad a message to a multiple 
of whatever the size of your block cipher is. So if you're using AES, your plain text has to be a multiple of 16 bytes, and that requires just adding some padding. And when you decrypt the ciphertext, you have to have a routine that does the decryption, looks at the message, and then removes that padding so you get the original message back. This is very straightforward. Uh, in SSL and TLS, which uses CBC mode, the check that you have to run verifies a specific kind of padding. And that padding looks like what you see down here below. Um, if you add five bytes of padding, each byte of padding is the integer 05. Or if you add four bytes, each byte of padding is the integer 04. And you can imagine that the decryption check is simply looking at each of those bytes, looking at the tail byte, seeing that it says five, and then going back to the previous four bytes, making sure they all also say 05, and then stripping them all off. If that check doesn't pan out, if some of those bytes don't make sense, what happens or happened in many TLS implementations is you would get a very specific error that said padding flaw, padding error. And using that, Serge Vaudenay showed that you could basically implement an attack where you take a ciphertext you want to decrypt, you maul it, you send it in to be decrypted in its mauled form. Mauling mean we just flip some bits. And this would actually change the underlying padding and we could leak information slowly. We could decrypt um, the entire plain text that lives underneath that, that ciphertext simply by repeating that decryption check over and over again. And this was a brilliant and, and in retrospect, very elegant, simple attack, but nobody knew about this before. So there's a generalization of this padding oracle check uh, and it's called a format oracle. The basic idea is, hey, padding is one kind of check that we can run on a decrypted ciphertext, but there's lots of other stuff we can do after we decrypt a ciphertext. We call this, um, this check Imagine that we have some function that takes in the decrypted message and outputs true or false. And we would say that a format oracle is anyone who decrypts a ciphertext and then computes this check function on the resulting plain text and sends us back the result. And the model looks like this. We get to send in a message C, a ciphertext C. Um, there's some crypto code that does the decryption, maybe using a insecure like a CBC mode uh, decryption. The resulting message goes off to some blob of application specific format checking code, which could do anything. Maybe it's you know expecting a piece of software and it runs that software in a virtual machine and that software seg faults. And so it says fail, that could be what happens in there even. Uh, you get a bit back to the crypto code, which goes back to the adversary. This is the model that we're in with format oracles. There are lots of other format oracles here. Okay, so the big thing about format oracles is if we do the encryption wrong, then, we're not just worried about the implications of the crypto code. The crypto code is not the only thing we need to look at. In order to exploit this, we have to think about the combination of crypto code plus this big blob of application specific format checking code, which could be arbitrarily complex and is no longer really a crypto problem. So if we wanna build an exploit, we have to understand that. Or if we wanna rule out an exploit, we have to understand what's happening in there too. So this idea of format oracles is the problem we're interested in. Now. You might ask, why are we even thinking about this problem? We know how to build crypto systems that stop these attacks. And these are systems that have authentication built into the encryption, I'm talking about symmetric encryption here. So the solution is use an authenticated encryption mode of operation like GCM and everything goes away. And this works pretty well in modern systems, except for three things. The first is that there are a lot of legacy systems out there that don't use authenticated encryption properly. An Apple iMessage, as an example, was produced in 2011, and that didn't use authentication properly, so we should expect there are many others out there that we can't really fix. Um, but even if you use authenticated encryption, there can be misuse problems. If somebody repeats a nonce, for example, an initialization vector to encrypt two different messages using AES GCM, terribly bad things happen, and you can actually recover a value that lets you forge a third message and a fourth message and so on. And then these attacks all come back to life just with one mistake. So this is not something that goes away just because we use authentication. And then the third thing is that OpenSSL is still an issue and keeps doing stupid things. So who knows what other problems are out there. And I'd like to just convince you that these problems continue to exist. Uh, there have been over the last five years, a handful of papers where cryptographers spend a lot of time trying to solve these things. Uh, Jaeger and Samarovsky have written like four or five papers on different versions of XML encryption and then JSON encryption, which don't have proper security and they can actually decrypt things using format oracles. Uh, we wrote a paper uh, that exploited GZIP. Another person found out that PGP uses GZIP and is vulnerable. 
Um, there are all sorts of things out there. It goes on and on and on. So lots of stuff out there. So we, the things we know about are probably the tip of the iceberg. It's all these very specific things that we have to worry about whether we can exploit. Okay, and so generally the statement here is it's pretty reasonable to bet that anything that doesn't use proper authenticated encryption and has a decryption oracle of some sort probably has some kind of format oracle attack, but the format oracle attack may be very, very hard to find. And they can be very complex. So if you're doing compression, binary data parsing or unmarshalling, who knows what that could be? Every single format oracle could potentially be different, different, and we may not even know whether something's exploitable or not just by looking at it. And so we want to get find a solution to this problem so we don't have cryptographers spending weeks or months trying to do it themselves. Okay, so this brings us to kind of the thesis of this paper, which is, hey, if we have a problem in attack-based cryptography that's hard, let's not have humans do the attack, right? We Let's have machines do the attack. And obviously that means get the humans out of the equation to speed things up. This is kind of what fuzzing does. Like there's a lot of other technology that we already use to implement attacks. Let's take this idea to this new setting. So we don't wanna obviously do something evil. What we wanna do is we wanna build a helpful tool that lets us automate the development of novel format Oracle attacks, not just execute attacks we already know, but to programmatically take in the information we know about a system and derive a new attack. Okay, this is our goal. Okay, I'm gonna get a little bit more concrete and I promise I will give examples before we get go deeper. Okay, so we are going to assume that we have the following ingredients and then we're gonna go from there. So the first thing that we care about is we want to have a machine readable description. We wanna know how our system works. And by know how our system works, it means that we should basically have the code of what's happening inside of it. So that means we have a machine readable description of our format checking function. This is again, a function that takes in a decrypted message of an arbitrary length and outputs true or false. We also will assume that we have a machine readable description of what we call the malleation characteristics of an encryption scheme. And by that, I mean, what is the nature of the scheme? How can we change a ciphertext? And what will that do when you decrypt that modified ciphertext to the underlying plain text? Some schemes are very malleable. You can flip arbitrary bits in the ciphertext. The plain text will have changes in those exact positions. Other schemes have more restricted kinds of malleation that's not so easy to target. Okay, the other thing we wanna have is we wanna be able to decrypt a ciphertext. So we have some ciphertext encrypted with a key we don't know, and we wanna somehow be able to use these attacks to decrypt it. And the final ingredient we need is a format oracle, which is someone who has the key will decrypt the ciphertext, apply this format checking function, and give us the result. And our goal in this, without humans being involved, is to derive automatically a sequence of experiments that will result in a full or partial decryption of that targeted target ciphertext C star. And this is what we're trying to build. By the way, anyone has questions at any point, just interrupt me. Okay. okay, so good. Our goal is to get humans out of the loop. So we just wanna feed this information to a machine and the machine will programmatically derive and execute the complete attack without any further human uh, intervention. That's goal one. Our secondary requirement is as follows. We want the attack to be efficient. We don't want the attack to make take a billion queries when we a human being could do it in 10,000. Um, we don't want it to take a million years to come up with the attack when a human being could come up with it in 10 years or 10 months or 10 weeks. So we wanna make things efficient in two different dimensions. Okay, I wanna briefly mention that there, this is related to some previous work people have worked on. So there is a lot of work on side channel attacks and there is some work doing symbolic execution of simple programs. And the idea is basically look at this program, try to identify a constraint set that this program implements and then solve for new side channel attacks. Some people have thought about this problem in that setting. It's not a very different problem than what we're thinking about. Uh, the problem is that most of these results operate over really small examples, like ciphertexts that are like two bytes long or very, very small RSA ciphertexts that are like 32 bits long. So it's not very useful to have a 32-bit RSA ciphertext. So this is not an area that's made a ton of progress, although there is some. Okay, so let's go back to our basic attack setting. All right, we have some ciphertext C star or C that encrypts an unknown plain text M star. And our goal is to decrypt that ciphertext and our ingredient to do this 
is we want to generate experiments for a decryption oracle that we can feed. So ciphertext we can feed to a decryption oracle, which will give us back a result bit B each time. We want to run that over and over again until we reach a decryption or we can't go any farther. So I'm going to give a really high level approach of how this problem works. Okay, so our first intuition is we want to formulate this as a constraint satisfaction problem. Okay, so just think about it. I'm going to not I'm going to ignore all the technology we need to do this. I just want to think about this the way a human being would think about this. Okay, we we always start off with some notion of what constraints we have on M star R. Now maybe the constraints are we have no constraints on M star. We know roughly how long the plain text is, but we don't really know anything else about it. So we might have an empty set of constraints except for length. But let's start with those initial constraints. Our next phase is this is just how a human being would approach this is generate a useful experiment. That means how do we modify our target ciphertext so it becomes a new ciphertext we can submit for decryption. Our third phase is great, we've done that. Let's run the experiment, send that new modified ciphertext off to be decrypted. Our fourth phase is great, well, we got a result. We got a true or a false from this oracle. How do we update this constraint set that we have? We've learned something about M star so we want to add a new constraint that increases our knowledge about M star. And then we say, okay, great, let's go back to step two and start by generating another experiment. And we keep doing that until we can't come up with any further constraints that we can add to what we know about M star. We're just stuck. Can't generate a new useful experiment. And then we're done. Maybe we have all of M star. Maybe that's why we're done. We have the entire decryption of the message. That's the best goal. Does this make sense? I want to stop for a second and take a sip of coffee and make sure this idea works. Actually, let me let me ask, has anyone seen these padding oracle attacks or implemented them as part of a class or anything like that? Uh, yes. Okay, good. I'm sorry if I'm covering really, really basic stuff. But you know, if you think about how you implemented those padding oracle attacks, this is what you did as a human being. Maybe we don't talk about constraints, but that's fundamentally what we're doing in here. Okay, good. So here is the hard part. So for a human being looking at a uh, description of an encryption scheme and a padding scheme, it's pretty easy to figure out how we generate a useful experiment. But how do we make a machine do this? This is actually the hard part of this. How do we generate an experiment that we think is going to give us some useful information about the underlying plain text and do this automatically without like card coding in specific rules for a specific function? And so for that, we need tools. We're going to go over probably the, the biggest tool that we need, which is this amazing thing in theory, um, which is that we have access to these tools called theory solvers. And you've probably heard of these. In fact, you probably use these. Um, they break up into two different categories, mostly, that we care about here anyway. One is the SAT solver, which is very famous. And the idea here is that we can give this solver a constraint formula, which is typically a Boolean CNF type formula, and it can solve the SAT problem. And it can identify a satisfying assignment or basically tell us, sorry, there is none. Or sometimes it just says, can't figure it out. And we know that SAT is a particularly hard problem. So the idea here is that, you know, for every possible SAT instance, or, you know, even like there, there certainly exists SAT instances that no solver is going to be able to solve. But for many that we care about, SAT solvers are actually really efficient. So they do exist and they do work. And then the extension of this is to satisfiability modulo theorem theorems which is SMT solvers. And these basically extend SAT to other kinds of logic. Um, SAT is a component of this, but there are other things like arithmetic logic and bit vector logic and array logic and so on. So our results here are mostly going to work with something called quantifier-free bit vector logic uh, using an SMT solver. But since this basically just reduces to SAT under the hood, SAT solvers are kind of enough to do everything we're going to do here. It's just convenient to work with an SMT solver. So I'm going to give you an explain. So are you just are you using just are you just bit blasting the bit, bit vectors down to down to CNF? Yeah, exactly. And, and at cert, a certain point, we're just saying to Z3, which is the solver we use, you do that for us. We don't want to think about it. And the way I'm going to present, yeah, sorry, go ahead. That's no, okay. It's okay. We'll, we'll, I, I have more questions later. Oh, okay. And feel free to ask questions anytime. Sorry, if you want to hold or ask now. Okay. <laughs> if you are, is there a reason you chose Z3 if you're using mostly bit vector theories and something like Boolector, which has typically better performance? Oh, I have many, many, many stories to tell you. I mean, actually, the answer is no, there's no good reason. We wanted to use Boolector. 
Um, the problem is we ran into some bugs in Bullector where uh, we need to work with very long bit vectors. Um, and the problem is we were having problems where anything over 64 bits in Bullector was crashing the solver. And we reached a point where we just said, ah, we're trying to fix this, but we can't figure out how to fix it. Um, it, I, it as I recall, I think that the way that Bullector had done certain uh, implementations just made it much trickier than you would have thought to extend mm -hmm. to larger bit vectors. We probably could have hacked it in some way. Um, so a lot of this, I'm gonna get to this a little later, but a lot of our choices are not necessarily the optimal choices. They are the chewing gum and duct tape that we were able to put together just to make this work. And so improving yeah. this is kind of, yeah, where we're going. I, 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 well, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in how, how you did this, but, um, but I think that it's possible if you, if you wanna make this a little more efficient, I think you could conceivably encode you 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 can encode a lot of this is all crypto stuff. You can it's, you can be, uh, conceivably encode it in Galois crypto crypto language, um, mm -hmm. constraints, and then um and then use their crucible tool to to output to like arbitrary solvers and just sort of ensemble solve and see what the what what comes back fastest. And I don't know if, it would, if, if even if Bullector crashes, then maybe you know when you discharge to like a pure SAT solver like uh, using like ABC through like one of Armin solvers, it'll just kill it quick more quickly. I don't. But I, oh, I should it's, it's a talk. great idea. <laughs> So, so the good the, the good thing about this is we're not even going deep into the crypto itself because everything we're doing is kind of above the crypto, um, mostly the padding schemes. But yes, I agree. That would be amazing. Like what you just described is my dream. Um, we just haven't had the engineering time to do it. So I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this is what we want to do. Is I mean, for, from my perspective, the SAT solver and the SMT solver we use are not relevant. It's just that engineering has been harder for us to get done. I mean, they're, they're relevant in the sense we want them to be as fast and efficient as possible. Um, but we also want them to not be, uh, not have specific properties. So we wanna be able to do this with anyone that satisfies our requirements. Good. Okay, I'm gonna go forward. And by the way, just for the rest of this, I'm gonna assume a kind of magical ideal SMT solver, um, just meaning that that's, that's how we're gonna specify things in, in terms of bit vector logic. Uh, we'll we'll talk later about how we make this actually work. All right. So here's what we know. So the in terms of theory solvers, here's the kind of good and bad. So if we have so the good news is if we have a set of constraints on M star, the solver can help us uniquely or partially solve for it. So I know that there's like certain things that we know about M star. Find me a solution that satisfies those constraints. Terrific. Solvers are beautiful at that. Wonderful. And we can always add constraints as we go. And and some solvers are very good at like compacting. If we have a big pile of constraints, they can reduce them into a simpler form. So they're very good at that. Um, the bad news is for our application, solvers have no concept of an Oracle query or an experiment. We need a way to derive those experiments and force the solvers to generate them for us. And we wanna do that without changing the solvers and like fundamentally, you know, we wanna use a black box to do this. We don't wanna make this box do something very specific, ideally. Okay, another thing we should point out is when it comes to malleability, when it comes to chosen ciphertext attacks, we don't wanna reason over the full encryption scheme. So I don't wanna think about AES. Um, putting AES or even a part of AES into a solver is terrifying. The only thing we really need to think about here is the scheme's malleation properties. And what I mean by that is if you think about like counter mode encryption, malleation and counter mode encryption really has nothing to do with the underlying cipher you're using. If you flip a bit in a particular position, then you know that regardless of the cipher, when that is decrypted properly, the corresponding bit is going to be changed in the resulting plain text. So that's the, that's what I mean by malleation. And that means we can define two very simple functions that define the properties of malleation. So we, we call them mall ciphertext and mall plain text, and they work like this. So mall ciphertext function takes in a ciphertext, obviously, and some string S, which we will call a malleation string an instruction string that says, here's how you maul the ciphertext. And that produces a mauled uh, C prime, new ciphertext. Similarly, we have a matched pair a function called maul plain text, which takes in a plain text, as you might imagine, takes in an identical, identically structured string S, malleation string, and produces a mauled uh, plain text M prime. And so S is this malleation string. And the basic idea here, let me go back. The basic idea here is, is in order for this to be meaningful, we need to define the pair such that essentially when we maul a given ciphertext with this S, so if I take an initial message, I encrypt it, and then I maul it using maul ciphertext and S, and I get a new ciphertext, and then I decrypt it, 
I will get a result that is not necessarily identical, but consistent with what would happen if I took that original plain text and I used the mall plain text function with the same string s and got to the resulting m prime. Now, in counter mode, you can kind of imagine how this works. Uh, in counter mode, you can basically define both of these functions as being the XOR, the bit, the stringwise XOR function. So flipping, you know, the seventh bit or having a XORing a value into the ciphertext will cause the plain text to change in a very predictable way. So it's easy to define these both as one function. Now, things get a little more complicated because some schemes, like for example, CVC mode, you've probably seen if you flip a certain bit in a block, if you change part of a block then upon decryption, the identical block position is basically pseudo randomly trashed. There are many possible decryptions for that. Since you don't know the secret key, you can't predict in advance exactly which of those decryptions will occur. And so we need a slightly more liberal definition of this where we allow there to be an actual set of outputs from the plain text malleation function. And if you look at the paper, we define that just a little bit more broadly. But the rough idea is that either we have an, an exact description of what happens to plain texts when you maul them or a slightly inexact one. And the other thing I just want to point out here is we don't care what's in these functions. The solver is going to take a description, a machine readable description of these functions, really just the ciphertext malleation, sorry, the plain text malleation function. It's going to take a description of that function. And that means that the actual contents of S are totally irrelevant to us. Um, they're defined by the function. So S could be like you know an XOR pad, or it could be a sequence of instructions saying, here's how you chop up the ciphertext and change it. We never have to think about it except as an abstract value, which is in turn defined by the function. Okay, good. So just some opaque string the solver has to reason over. All right, so let's talk about the actual technique. All right, so here is what we have. I wanna sort of walk through how this could look. Um, our very first step is we have some initial constraints on this message, this plain text M star. And we call this the initial constraint set, we'll call it G0. And if you look at this, I'm sort of showing you a set. Let's imagine that we have a set of possible candidates for M star that are allowed by this constraint set, which by the way, could just be empty. Maybe every possible plain text is allowed. But let's say each of these dots in the circle represents one possible candidate for M star. And just to kind of make this easier, I've actually drawn this arrow to illustrate where the real M star is in this set. All right, but we, as the person trying to attack this, don't know that. Okay, so we need to identify an experiment. We have to identify an experiment in this case, which is defined as a malleation string S that we can feed to that ciphertext malleation function along with our target ciphertext, and then get a new actual ciphertext we can submit to the oracle. And the goal is to identify a malleation string S that's useful. And by useful, I mean it's going to eliminate one or more of the candidate plain text from this set. Otherwise, it's not very useful to us. Okay, so how do we find S? How do we find this malleation string, this experiment? And how are we going to guarantee that it eliminates one or more plain text candidates? Well, the solution to that's actually not very hard it's pretty straightforward it just works out to asking the solver to solve a relatively simple constraint system which is um, expressed here in terms of the plain text malleation function and f let me try to explain this in a pretty simple way um, what we're going to basically do is we're going to say look i want you to come up with two candidate plain texts i'm going to call those m0 and m1 they could be any of the plain texts that's in this set that's defined by the current constraint system. It doesn't matter to me which two you pick, just find two. And I want you to find an experiment S, a malleation string S that when we apply that to the ciphertext and run it to the Oracle, is guaranteed to eliminate one of these two messages. And that can be expressed as follows. So GI, remember, is the current constraint set. So we have to say GI, expressed on M0 equals one, meaning M0 has to be in there. GI expressed on M1 has to be equal to one. So both of these messages have to be allowed by the current constraint set. Um, then we basically say, look, here's what we wanna say. We wanna say that F, the uh, check function on the plain text malleation function of M0 with this given S is equal to zero. And at the same time, F evaluated on the plain text malleation function of M1 with this string S you found is equal to one. We assume that this um, oracle is, is deterministic. It's only it's going to output a zero or a one reliably. 
And so here we're guaranteed that if we get a zero, one of these plain text candidates cannot be the actual message. And if we get a one from the Oracle, the other plain text candidate cannot be the actual message M star. And so this means that whatever result we get from the Oracle, we can eliminate one message. Okay, so we send this um, mauled ciphertext off to the Oracle, we get a response B. And then what do we do with that response? Well, we add a new constraint to the constraint set. And so what the constraint that we add is basically this. We say, look, here's the new constraint. We say that F, which is the check function, when expressed on you know, this value, mall plane of whatever M star is, uh, X comma S, is equal to this specific bit we got back. So we're just appending the result of our experiment to the constraint set in this form. And that has the effect of eliminating one of the two plain text candidates. It may also eliminate other plain text can candidates, but it's guaranteed to eliminate at least one. And here we've eliminated the message M1. Does that make sense? Anyone have questions about that? This is a very fast run. Maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not. Okay, let me ask a question instead of. Um, having you ask me questions. So this approach works, and I, I will claim to you that if we repeat this until the solver can no longer devise an experiment, we will eventually eliminate, I mean, in each phase where we the solver is able to come up with a result, we will eliminate at least one message and possibly more from the candidate set for M star. And we can stop when the solver is unable to make further progress, and we just solve for M star, which will either be exact or a partial solution for M star. Great, I claim that that does work. The question is, why is this a bad idea? Like, why is this not necessarily the best approach? What is the limitation of this? All I'm able to claim to you is we eliminate one message at every iteration. That's, that's a lot of messages. It's a lot of messages, right? So I have a 256-bit message, which is not a long message in the scheme of things. There are two to the 256 possible plain texts. I can eliminate one at each query. I'm going to be making a lot of queries. This is going to go on forever. I mean, it's effectively an exponential time attack, and that's not going to work. And we know that things like simple padding oracles can work much more efficiently than that. So this attack doesn't guarantee us anything. In fact, one of the very first things I did when we started this is I coded up this simple attack, and I started attacking really tiny messages that were like, 32 bits long to see what happened just using Z3. And the answer is it actually worked surprisingly fast. It would completely decrypt the message in, I don't know, a reasonable number, not two to the 32 queries. And I felt like, hey, this is great. And then I put in slightly longer messages and suddenly it just took forever. And, and the reason is that it was not necessarily heading down an exponential time attack, but it was certainly not the most efficient attack either. Um, and I was mostly just getting lucky, I think, with those short messages, but longer ones, this approach did not scale. Well, for obvious reasons. Great. Okay. So, good news. We're definitely going to have an experiment, a technique here that either halts or makes progress. Uh, if the solver can find an experiment, we're always going to eliminate one plain text candidate. Bad news is we're not guaranteed to eliminate more than one. We might get lucky and eliminate a lot in one go, but there's no reason to believe that. And so, this will become infeasible or tend towards infeasibility for large message spaces. So the obvious solution here is we need to find a solution that maximizes the cut. And by cut here, I mean the number of messages we eliminate with each query. Now, how do we do that? Well, the answer is simple, or the idea here is simple. Instead of solving, uh, asking the solver, find me a pair of messages M0 and M1, we could ask the solver instead to find us a set of messages, calligraphic M0 and calligraphic M1. They find these large collections of messages, and these messages still have to satisfy the same property, right? So before we had to make sure that our query, our, our experiment S, would eliminate either one message M0 or one message M1. But now we want to find a whole set of messages M0 and a whole set of messages M1, such that this experiment will eliminate everything in that set M0 or everything in that set M1. Seems nice. So we'll ask for subsets. And then you know we'll 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 require this is just requiring that an entire subset can be eliminated at once. That's nice. And then the thing is, we want to reason over the size of these sets. We want to tell the solver uh, 
find me a large subset M0 and a large subset M1. So more messages will be eliminated at each go. And the larger the size of these subsets, the more messages are potentially going to be eliminated with each query. And so the attack will be faster. We'll zero in on M star. And so this whole thing becomes a set size maximization problem. The problem here is that unfortunately, and this is not, you know, this is nice to express this as logic. The minute, and, and I started with really no understanding of solvers. So clearly some of you folks in the audience already have vastly more knowledge about solvers than I do. But I started with no understanding of them. So I thought, sure, great, solvers can do anything. We'll just reason about sets and we're done. Uh, it turns out there are a handful of solvers that can reason over sets. Um, there's some experimental ones that can handle set logic. Um, but gen generally speaking, they don't reason over very large sets well. So if you have sets that are like two to the 128 and up, which is what we're thinking about, suddenly this kind of logic doesn't work terribly well. And worse, it's really hard to find solvers that have this notion of set size maximization as an option. You kind of want to say, hey, make a get find me the biggest set that satisfies this. That's not a native concept that too many production or even experimental solvers. Just, can just in case this. you <clears throat> There yeah. is a solver uh, called SBSAT, um, written by uh, Sean Weaver at NSA um, when he was a grad student, that, uh, that has a, uh, a format uh, that allows you to make statements about cardinality constraints. And it, um, it's based, it's a state-based satisfiability solver. It uses these like state-based BDD sort of uh, techniques. So mm -hmm. um, it actually is a little bit more efficient at these sort of things than standard CNF or CDCL type solvers. So, um, oh, okay, uh, interesting. Uh, do you know if it works for really large sets? Uh, no, but uh, Sean lives in Baltimore. You can ask him. <laughs> okay. What's your uh, last name? Sorry, I'm just. Uh, Sean Weaver. Okay. All right. I've scribbled that down. All right. No I'll one more. This stuff is great. Uh, and, I think keep in mind. Or something. Okay. That'd be terrific. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, keep in mind, I'm coming from the perspective of an applied crypto person, and I'm entering this field where I know nothing. So it literally, things you are telling me during this this presentation are probably going to be huge news to me. So don't be surprised that I don't know these things because I, I really, you know, just entering this problem, I've been learning a lot. It's been interesting. Okay, so we were not able to find a solver that could do this for large sets. And it turns out that this is actually kind of a hard problem in general. And this should have been something I also knew, um, but I did not know, which is that the, you know, the entire problem of counting the number of satisfying solutions to a constraint system is a fairly hard problem. It's uh, known as model counting in the, um, in the literature of SAT solvers and before solvers. Uh, it's also known as sharp SAT in the theory literature, which probably many more of you do know. Um, it's strictly harder than SAT, it's sharp P complete. And exact model counting techniques, by exact, I mean getting the exact number of solutions, uh, they exist. There are solvers that actually implement this and they do work pretty well. But if you think about this, the, the problem that they have is that they're trying to look at, and I'll say this generally, kind of a tree of solutions. And they work really well when they can lop off big branches and they can say, well, we know the solution isn't anywhere in this huge branch of uh, you know, sub solutions that might be correct solutions. We can eliminate an entire class of solutions. But when the solutions themselves are kind of sparsely and finely distributed throughout the solution space, they work less well because you think about it, you have to sort of head down and find all of the exact solutions and count them. Um, it's not necessarily as easy to do, although I hear there's been some progress recently that makes this much more efficient. So exact counting solutions seem a little bit inapplicable or less applicable to our problems. Maybe there's a more efficient way for us to do this. And it turns out there's a great literature of people who've said, forget about exact counting. Let's deal with approximation. Uh, how do we do efficient approximate model counting? Finding an approximation of the number of solutions that are out there that work very efficiently. And what's cool about these techniques is they don't require modifications to the underlying solver. They can be used with an, a SAT or an SMT solver. That's kind of a black box, which is what we've been doing so far in this presentation. Okay, so the approximate counting techniques have a very, very old pedigree. They go back to the 1980s. Um, they were introduced by Valiant and Vazirani back in like 1984 or something. Um, and the basic idea is this. Uh, let me explain this. So imagine we have some constraint. This is just such a simple and elegant technique. It's possible everybody knows about it. I did not. Um, imagine we have a constraint formula, which we'll describe as G. And what we want to do is we don't want to exactly count the number of satisfying assignments, but we want to 
create a hypothesis, which is that there are approximately two to the n satisfying assignments for some n. And so what we do is really simple. And by there are approximately two to the n or at least two to the n. So what we do is we reduce the set of possible solutions by two to the negative n. We just eliminate, hopefully, pretty much at random, a large fraction of the solutions. And the way we do this in practice is really simple. We sample n random pairwise independent hash functions, call them h1 through hn. And each of these hash functions is basically, it outputs a single bit, true or false. And so we create a new constraint system, which is the original formula G, but in addition to that, the constraints that for i equals one to n, each of hi on the solution has to be equal to one. So this idea basically eliminates under the assumption these pairwise independent hash functions you know, do what we'd like them to do, eliminates many possible solutions. And the intuition is this. Each hash function you add to the constraint system cuts the solution space approximately in half. So we do that n times if the solver is still able to find one solution with those additional restrictions. then there should be about, or at least two to the n solutions to G. It's highly probabilistic, it's not a guarantee, but it's probable this is the case. Um, using universal hash functions means that it doesn't matter what the actual distribution of solutions is in the underlying space. Uh, these We basically are able to somewhat randomly eliminate half of them with each bit. Of course, it's not terribly accurate. We get some kind of, sometimes we undercount or we overcount. Uh, but to increase the accuracy, we can just run multiple trials, which at least firms this up and gives us more confidence in our results. Okay, so this is the underlying technique. It's very simple. The hash functions can be things like parity functions, which work really well. Very simple to implement. Have a lot of XORs, so solvers have to be able to deal with that, but they can deal with that now. Okay, good. So let's revise our technique. So in our early description, we asked the solver to find an individual message M0, an individual message M1, and uh, experiment S. Now what we're going to do is we're still going to ask the solver to find an individual message M0 and an individual message M1. But we're going to add N of these randomly sampled hash constraints to each of M0 and M1. And the idea there is that it should be the case if it can find one solution for M0 and one solution for M1 with these hash constraints, that there must be many possible solutions for M0 and M1. And that means, especially if we do many trials, we know that there are actually subsets, large subsets of messages that have these same properties. So that's it. Um, okay, good. So if we do this for a uh, number of hash constraints n, we've identified, and we do this, use n constraints for both m0 and m1, then we know that each of these subsets we've identified has size approximately two to the n. And so if we don't find a solution after a few trials, we can just iterate. We say, okay, we start with a very large n, let's say two to the size of the message, and we reduce that by one and we keep going, or we can do a binary search until we find a solution, the largest value of n for which we find a solution for both m0 and m1 is where we stop and we go with that as our experiment on the assumption that we've now found a pair of subsets of size approximately 2 to the n. And that's it. Good. Any questions about that? I'm trying to be mindful of time. Do I have to finish it in four minutes or do I have 10 minutes? Uh, you have up till one, but I have to teach a class at one. So for me, that's a hard okay. stop. Okay, I will be done at uh, 12.55, I promise. Okay, good. So I want to quickly get, I want to skip past this. This is a description of the attack algorithm. This is a description of the malleation finding and so on. So all of this is great. It's a really simple idea. Um, now, all of this stands in um, for months and months of engineering pain, of working through multiple SMT and SAT toolkits, not getting things to work, submitting bug fixes upstream, basically tying together a collection of different solvers. We had to tie together Z3 and a thing called Crypto Minisat, which is wonderful, uh, which is able to handle very large XOR parity constraints, which is what we needed. Um, and then we had to beg people, even with all these optimizations, we had to beg people for lots of computing time. And the result is a tool that we call Delphinium. Uh, it's based on Z3, but we just use Z3 as a front end and we feed the resulting CNFs into Crypto Minisat. Uh, it takes in Python code for the format checking function and the malleability um, functions. 
It's only about 6,000 lines of Python, mostly, because it's pretty efficient. The solvers do all the work. Um, and we're working on speeding it up, but it's it's able to do, well, we've, we've seen a lot of improvement. Okay, I wanna just show you something very quick in my last few minutes, just to prove that this actually works. So just for ground truth, we tried it with a few examples of very simple functions for which we know there are chosen ciphertext attacks. And this is the PKCS number seven padding function, which I showed you when I talked about Baudinet's padding attack. So we have a message here on the left and we have five padding bits on the right. And the basic idea is that the adversary in these attacks, we're gonna assume uh, something like counter mode encryption. So we have really very flexible XOR based malleation. But the way that you attack these things in real life as a human being is you basically want to increase the length of the padding by finding the length of the padding and then XORing something to this message so that each of the fives becomes a six byte. And then you can learn something about the leftmost message bit. This is the intuitive explanation of how a human being finds the attack. Um, so let's see what this looks like. I'm gonna skip past this. I asked my grad student, Gabby, to actually implement the attack the way she, as a human being, would implement it. And we printed out her attack. What you're seeing are the experiment strings. These are the values that are XORed with a 128-bit ciphertext in order to run a padding oracle attack against a 128-bit message. And what you see is kind of what you'd expect as a human being. She flips a bit on the right side, then she kind of iterates through a whole bunch of different values on the leftmost byte. She learns something eventually, and then she flips some other bits, and then she iterates. And you can kind of see this very specific structure is her counting. Now let's see what, what happens when we feed this padding check as a format function and the malleation of just XOR into the solver. Let me fast forward here. This is what the description looks like we get this result. And what you can see is it does not exactly look like something a human being would choose. Whereas Gabby's attack kept a whole bunch of bits fixed to zero. Um, here in this, it just kind of looks like noise on the left side, although you can see the solver actually recovering bytes of the message one byte at a time as it moves left. And so what's really happening here is that because of the way we do some of the, uh, the randomized uh, sampling, we're getting essentially random noise in any bit that's not constrained, which is fine. And what's also happening here, you can't see, is that counting that Gabby did is happening, but the machine doesn't need to do counting in order. It can do counting in any order. So that looks like noise too. So this is just kind of cool to see these attacks popping out of the solver that are, you know, still just about what you'd expect, but but very machine looking and random. And just to zoom in to show you what that looks like. Um, that's just Gabby versus the machine. You can see there pretty different, but not entirely different. Here is another way of looking at the attack. This shows the number of candidate plain texts that are available as we go on. And the um, x-axis here is query number and candidate messages goes up to about two to the 120 or something like that. And you can see that in this case, this one particular attack, the human developed attack is actually slower than the machine attack. That's mostly just kind of randomness. It's not specific to the technique, but you can see how the machine goes. It basically, tries to eliminate messages, it gets a whole byte, and then you can see the number of candidate plain text plummets, and that's the attack happening. Uh, let me just show you a couple more pictures in my last few minutes. Uh, we developed a bitwise padding scheme, and the way this works is you have a length of the um, padding, which is expressed as an, a 32-bit, I think, or a 16-bit integer on the very right side, and then you have padding, which is basically all one bits. And when you do an attack on this, again, using XOR malleation, you can see what the solver is doing. It is basically attacking one bit at a time. You can see it's counting. The value that is the counter of the padding size is being modified on the right side of this diagram. And then you can sort of see the padding being discovered one bit approximately per query. And you can see it basically discover the entire contents of the padded message, including the padding. Um, in essentially very close to optimal number of queries that you could get for this padding scheme. We did some crazy stuff, some stupid things. We uh, decided to come up with some weird padding schemes. We encoded a, a scheme. This is not a padding scheme, actually. It's a format scheme. Um, it encodes a four by four Sudoku board. It's a very, very simple uh, cipher tag, plain text. We encrypted that with a stream cipher. And then we fed the entire thing with a padding check that basically verifies that a Sudoku board is correct. And we fed that into this 
uh, machine to see if it could actually decrypt Sudoku boards based on just getting the result of whether a Sudoku board is correct. And we ran it, and it turns out to be very efficient because four by four isn't very big. Um, what you can see, though, is this is what the solver learns as it makes queries. You can see it starts by querying with these mauled boards, and the knowledge of the solver gradually increases until it gets to a final state where it knows everything in the uh, board. Okay, so there are lots of other things we did. We had to do a lot of work to handle CBC mode, truncation, and other kinds of malleation. And we're working on more complex uh, types of experiments and format functions that are related to recent vulnerabilities. So this is work in progress. It's not a tool you can go out and probably use for extremely sophisticated format functions yet, but we hope that with a lot of engineering improvement, someday it will be. Since I'm a little low on time, let me give the quick summary. The summary is, we built a thing that actually works. I'm super happy. The techniques work. Uh, it still has a huge amount of work to go before it's going to be a practical tool, but eventually we'll be able to do more. And there is still work to do on side channel attacks. So we hope these techniques will be useful. Um, it produces results at scales of, you know, 128 to 256 bits, <laughs> which doesn't sound big, but is vastly larger than some of the previous solver based work. And sort of it gives us a way into the solver community, the solver development community. Uh, gives us new problems for them to solve and to optimize for, because I think there's a lot of room for further refined improvement to solvers that can help in this line of work. And I'd like to create that kind of uh, interaction. So that's it. That's all I have uh, for this talk. If anyone has time for questions, I'm sorry I've used up so much of the time, but I'm happy to stay and answer them. Uh, I have a couple of, uh, of comments and, or, and slash questions. Um, one is uh, this stuff looks really awesome, and I think it would be really useful uh, to the to the solver community. Um, they're always looking for fun industry problems to use as part of the SAT and SMT competitions, um, and so I think that you probably generate a lot of interesting SMT instances that would be very very good to. to so if you considered uh, talking to the folks who run those those comps and, and giving them these as a uh, giving them your your uh, constraint problems as examples. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we've been working a bit with um, uh, Mate Sus uh, and um, some folks in Singapore who have been basically working on, on crypto mini sat. And yes, that's what we want to do. I'm not convinced that our problem, we, we've refined our um, formulae as much as we should. Mm -hmm. So giving it to these competitions right now might be a little premature as much as I would love to make people tackle these huge, huge constraint systems. Um, but yeah, I, that's definitely something we want to do. If you want to, if you want to align to the developers of CBC four, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to provide. Yes, please. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, so, um, the other, uh, so by the way, I, I am a former, uh, Apple employee in the formal verification of hardware only. I don't oh, know. No. I, I don't, I, I, I say nothing about the software people there. They can do whatever they, uh, who dabbles a little bit in crypto. Um, and I was, I was, uh, I was interested in, in, uh, wondering if, you think, and I, and I think I, I'd be interested in maybe looking at this. Do you think there's some way to, to characterize, um, it'd be nice if we could characterize um, sort of uh, protocol implementations that were vulnerable to chosen cyber text attacks um, so that, you know, you could just sort of say, you know, that, you know, so that you don't have to, so that no one has to like knowingly nod and say, oh, we've got something under the hood when in fact yeah. they, don't. they could have, they could have done something to verify specifically using something like a constraint solver, maybe maybe it wouldn't be a sound reason, maybe it wouldn't be a sound solution, but it would say, you know, something like, oh yeah, we're pretty sure that, you know, or, or oh yeah, we found that we think, we found evidence of a, of a padding oracle attack because this constraint solver can, for at least a smaller problem, yeah. a smaller scale problem, find, find, a, find you know, decrypt some, some ciphertexts. Yeah, that's exactly what we'd like to be able to do. So maybe we don't care about decrypting something, but we just want to prove it can be done. Um, that's definitely a great motivation for doing this kind of work. I agree. Yeah, and I'd like to be able to give a tool that people can actually apply to their systems and see if there's a problem. Okay, great. Awesome. Is there one last question? Uh, John, you got to unmute if you want to talk. Muted now. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, SCP and WinSCP, as I put in my comment, they're used millions of times a day.
Uh, do you have, have you ever applied any of your tools and do you have a decoder that can no. decrypt these? I, I have, didn't even know about this and now I do and I'm gonna go check it out as soon as I'm done with this, <laughs> with this talk. Okay. I love finding protocols that I don't even know about that might be vulnerable, so great. Thank you so so much, Matt. It was a very uh, exciting talk, um, and I look forward to the possibility of interacting with you more this year. In person, hopefully someday. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> okay, right. well, we'll reconvene here in two weeks. Um, if anybody has suggestions for more speakers, please send me email. I Thank have you. to go teach the insure class now, so I have to say goodbye to everybody. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll drop off now.